Ron Silver's illustrious career includes a Tony Award, memorable roles on Broadway, also in motion pictures and television. He now stars opposite Kirstie Alley in the smash NBC sitcom, which is called Veronica's Closet. And I'm pleased to welcome Ron uh, back to CBS and to our show for the first time, and thanks for coming on. Nice to be here. Uh, sitcom, uh, this sitcom is a bit of a change of pace for you. We, we, we see a different Ron Silver from the man <laughs> that we've seen in many motion pictures. Yeah. Lighthearted, with a smile on his face, and a good guy. Yeah. You're yeah. enjoying it. I'm having a ball. I've been looking to get into this situation for a while now. It's affable. It's like the other stuff is fun, but it's brooding. It's a certain type of work, and you have to kind of investigate parts of yourself that uh, darker sides that you don't particularly admire all the time. And it can be a little depressing, you know. This I is know. kind of fun. I remember the first time I chatted with you, I worked for ABC Radio, and you were in the picture where you played Alan Dershowitz. Uh, well, that's not a serial killer. No, no, he but, defends I mean, them. And it was the Klaus von Bülow story. Oh, it was heavy, it was true. brooding, it was, it, it was not what you'd call a light it's piece. It's serious, right. it's kind of intense and all. This is, this is kind of fun. You're always looking for the lighter side. You're looking to laugh, you're looking to be silly, you're looking to find that childish yeah. stuff. Now, what about the visibility of weekly television, episodic television? Do you find that the press, especially the tabloid press, pays more attention to what you do? It's funny you mention that. Yeah, isn't it though that I just brought it up on, on the spur <laughs> of the moment? Just yeah. like that, yeah. did you? I have, I've been very fortunate. I haven't been involved with the tabloids, either because I wasn't a big enough star or my life wasn't theatrical enough or whatever. Uh, but I, I think being on weekly television does, does feed that because there was something in the tabloids the other day and it, I was kind of, I, I don't like to think of myself as naive, I don't think I am, but mm -hmm. I, was, I was astonished. The, a story was made up out of whole cloth with quotes given to me, I never spoke to anybody, demonstrably false things that went on. It was, it, I mean, if I were more used to it, I would have found it laughable, but I was shocked. Without repeating that it was all so that was irresponsible. involved, what, what were the allegations that they made? They the said thing? that Kirsty and I had love scenes and that uh, we, she refused to kiss me and I became upset. If you look at the three scripts, there are no love scenes. I don't know right. where the relationship's going at the end of the season, right. but at this point, they said the show shut down. It never shut down. They uh, attributed, quote, it was hysterical. And what's funny about it is we're doing a show now about the tabloids, which was... You know, set up. I, I, don't I know wonder if people. Very read, I, I wonder if people in the business who read that sort of thing, because you know, shutting down a show implies not only downtime but loss of money. You know, it, oh, it, yeah. it, it's but costly. You know what? People, so I, I just wonder if people in the business who are naive might think, "Geez, we can't hire Ron no, Silver because he's no, trouble." No, 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 no. That's not it. it it's okay. kind of laughable. It's kind of silly. But the the problem is that nobody reads that stuff. But other people pick it up, and the way the, uh, the information system seems to work now, once it gets into a database, people don't remember where they got the original information uh -huh. from. And they say, I heard, or this was that. And of course, the libel laws, and a lot of my friends were involved in what I think is the right side of the issue, you know, protecting the press in this case. Mm -hmm. But they, they are so um, irresponsible in some areas of the media now that they, the, uh, without abrogating anybody's rights, you have to shift a little bit and protect the privacy of some people here because this Sullivan law is, 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 is tough. And the, you can be defamatory in the press, you can be demonstrably uh, malicious and all, but the, the criteria set up in the, in the federal standards anyway, constitutional standards, are a little tough. And a lot of people are harmed by it. I mean, in my case, it's silly. It's, yeah, it's silly. It's, it's yeah. But they do some terrible things to some people. There's a law passed in California now, but I, I think that law uh, really has to do with trespassing and using telephone enhancing or auto enhancing. It, it doesn't really strike at the heart of Sullivan. Let me ask you here about Ron Silver, Californian. I had it in my head that you were a confirmed New Yorker and the time spent in California was torture. And you told I me you, 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 you love California. Yeah, I lived you, here for nine years. I adored California. It's just I needed some place for my kids to go to school. Right. And I didn't want to shift them back and forth. I had a very old-fashioned kind of way about thinking about uh, a neighborhood and education and mm -hmm. being close to family. Most of my family was back east. So I try to have it both ways. I, I always liked living out here. And until the children were five, six years old, I was out here. But let me ask you if this is true, that, that, that you like to spend as much of your off time as possible uh, in New York. Well, I go back to New York because family's there. My Kids live there. Your mother and back, father are there. School. Yeah, that, my mother and father are included in my family. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my children are back there in school. Uh, my son's in college back east, and my, my daughter goes okay. to school back there. So I get back there quite often. I have a lot of friends there, but I live in both places. I'm living out here now, obviously. Obviously. And when, when you live in New York, when you did live in New York as a kid, what was your neighborhood then? Where, where, where did you Lower live? Lower East Side. Oh, okay. I don't know what it's called now, Village East or whatever. It has a cachet now. Yeah. It never did when I was growing up. It was 
kind of a tenement and people were kind of leaving the Lower East Side. It's, it's kind of amusing actually. My son's 19 years old now and I have an apartment on the Upper East Side now, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a different type of neighborhood than where I grew up. And when he goes back, he, uh, he likes going downtown. He likes staying with my folks. The, the apartment I try to get out of all my life. <laughs> He's downtown now. That's where the clubs are. That's where the music is. And the passion of the streets in New York is the there, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's and, a lot of yelling. People, and, uh, yeah, that's true. You know, in California, I don't know if you've noticed this, but nobody yells out here. Well, it disturbs the placidity of the place. Everything is so perfect. The lawns are always the same. People always look nice. They, they never rage very much. Yeah. Everything is calm and nice. I mean, to raise your voice kind of... <laughs> Whereas in New York, you know, there's a lot of yelling, and, uh, you know, it's a way of communicating. It gets, gets the heart going. You, yeah. you live at the top of your lungs, and it, no harm meant. It's just the way people talk yeah. to one another. And as a boy growing up, were you like a Yankees fan? No. When I was growing up, I was a Giant fan. In New fact, I, I had an uncle that was a fanatic, and he used to take me to the polo grounds. I've just aged myself. And he used to take me out of school, and we used to go see doubleheaders when they were playing Pittsburgh. Now, the Giants were in seventh place in those days. Pittsburgh was in eighth place in those days. We'd go to doubleheaders on a Wednesday to afternoon. see them fight for seventh, yeah. And sit in the bleachers only because at the end of the game, the clubhouse was all the way back in center field. It was the longest center field. It was like 481 to dead center. The clubhouse was there. So all the players had to leave the dugout to walk all across the field to the clubhouse. So you could, Willie Mays and Don Mueller and all the people, yeah. you can go up and see them. So I was a, a rabid Giant fan, and in those days, Baseball was very New York centric because it was Dodger fans fighting Giant fans talking about the Yankees who were always winning and this and that and who was better, Mantle or Mays, and, and some people said Duke Snyder. I don't know why they <laughs> brought that up. But, uh, and New York, you know, was in the series uh, seven out of ten times. That's correct. Playing one another, you know, in 54, Cleveland got in in 47. And, but basically it was New York. New York, felt, usually uh, many years, Brooklyn and the Yankees would wind absolutely. up in the series, the oh. Subway Series. Went to Ebbets Field a lot, the Polo Grounds, and then they then they moved after the 57. Did it break your heart when the Giants left? Everybody talks about you know how the how the Dodgers broke the hearts it of Brooklyn. Was, how how about was, the Giants? It was terrible. It was first of all, you know, the Polo Grounds is across the uh, Harlem River there, and you could see Yankee Stadium. That's correct. Both stadiums could have seen one another. And uh, when they left, the first year they were there, they didn't play in Candlestick Park. They played in Seal Stadium, I think. But they would not broadcast the games. Les Kaida would sit in a booth in New York City with a pencil or a pen. And every time he would say, it's a beautiful day here in Seal Stadium here. The sun is shining. Down. It's 11 o'clock at night. He was pretending it was 8. This and that. And then whenever there was a hit, he'd hit the pen That's on the right. mic. That's right. So, whoop, there's some contact there. And I used to sit up and listen to these games. For some reason, I thought my fortunes were very tied to the Giants. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I look back on it now, I say, I can't believe that the energy, the time, the, what I invested in this team. Horace Stoneham didn't care as much no, as I did about didn't. the Giants. No, he didn't. Willie Mays didn't care. I <laughs> no, mean, they he went didn't. to other teams no, and all. But, but it was part of Ron Silver's growing it, up as a kid. It was yeah. very important yeah. to me. You know, I interviewed Les Kiter once a long time ago, and did he was you? one of the great recreators of baseball games. A lot of people know Les Kiter. Well, Les Kiter was, was a sports guy in Philadelphia when I worked That's there right. in the 60s. And he and Gordon McClendon, who used to run the Liberty Broadcasting System, were great recreators of baseball games. It came in on ticket tape, right? It, right. And if the tape went down, it was a rain delay. Well, That's right. the, the, hey, right. the rain just began That's falling here at Seal Stadium, folks. We'll have to wait for a while until the ticker starts running again. Huh? It was unbelievable. Let me take a Today fast. was not a good day for New York baseball. Uh, no, it wasn't. But if you were a Cleveland fan, it was the greatest call in the history of the game when the yeah, guy got hit yeah, by the that ball. Was some, yeah. That was some call. We're with Ron Silver, one of the stars of Veronica's Closet on NBC. The toll-free is up and running. And after this break, we're coming right back. Outside the line. We're still arguing about the damn bunt today at Yankee Stadium, and I, I, I have That's no a, dog in the fight between New York and Cleveland that was anyway. A terrible call. It was that a was terrible horrible. call. Unless you were a Cleveland fan, it was the greatest call. It was the, still a bad call. Know, if you were a baseball fan, it was a bad call. Here is uh, Tom in Baltimore. Hi, Tom, and welcome to CBS. Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'd like to ask Mr. Silver. Sure. Um, in all of your esteemed stage work, and I saw you in this production, um, you were brilliant in Speed the Plow. Thank you. And I wanted to know what it was like to work with Madonna. You know, I only have very nice things to say. I know a lot of people bring up Madonna's name because they want to hear something uh, uh, maybe not so nice. But I I'm had... not looking for anything negative. Oh, I'm just great. Curious. It was terrific. She was very professional. Um, and, and I say that like I'm surprised. I don't mean to, to sound like that. But she was not on her own turf. This is somebody who owns a stage when you see her perform. There is nothing... 
that she fears doing on a stage, and she's very provocative all the time, this and that. This was a little different because it, uh, she was constrained. She had a script. She had the same words every night. She had to be very contained in terms of her own theatricality and her own personality. So it was a very, very different environment for her, and she did it beautifully. She never missed a rehearsal. She was there. She went on stage in a very difficult role with people who were more familiar with that environment, Joe Montaigne and myself. Well, and, and, as, I, and as far as I'm concerned, she did own the stage when I saw it. Absolutely. She did an extraordinary job. And she was great fun to be with and uh, a lot of fun afterwards. I, leaving the theater afterwards was kind of fun because we would be in the theater where we felt kind of protected in, in an environment we understood. And then when we went out, it was, it was the rock world. It was an insane world. The gauntlet. People, people throwing themselves on the car. Madonna, we love you. Madonna, we love you. And if she didn't sign everyone's autograph, it was Madonna, we hate you. We're going to come to your home and kill you. I mean, the, the ups and downs. Like, yeah. Joey and I would walk out silently together and go down the block for a beer and say, oh my God, that poor woman. Yeah. But she was great. Well, you she said the key word, professional. She came oh, in, yeah. hit the no, marks, did great. her work, and, and, and was a joy to be with. Tom, I'm glad you called. Thanks for watching tonight. Tom, may I say one more thing, please? Sure, sure. As a uh, Baltimorean, um, since you already touched on baseball this evening, um, just like to say RIP Mark Belanger. Uh, oh, yeah. Well said. Well said. Great player and uh, the death. And uh, by the way, what's 54. Not... 54 years old. Well, but let's yeah. also not forget... Uh, Quisenberry, oh, the yeah, quiz, and, yeah. 45 and years old to a brain tumor last week, which was a shock to me because I will never forget him pitching for Kansas City with, you know, the sidewinder. Unbelievable pitch. Well, and also to pray for Cal Sr. Uh, amen. Yeah. Tom, I'm glad you called. Thanks for the reminder. Thanks. Thank Good night, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What was the first job you had in California when, when you left New York to come out here and work in? in I, I had a, a couple of jobs. I came out here with an off-Broadway review of comedy. Uh, El Grande de Coca-Cola with Jeff Goldblum was, was the other fellow. It was his first show, too. And uh, one of the first jobs I got was, uh, you were talking about your dog before, there mm -hmm. was a show called Here's Boomer. Oh, and it was the, a, it, the dog on NBC. It was on yeah. NBC. And um, Here's Boomer was a show uh, where they had guest stars every week, and this dog would help the guest star through whatever the enterprise was that week. So I was the guest star that week, and there, there were three boomers, actually. There was a, a very quick one, there was a very smart one, I guess, and some, some dog that did tricks. I, I don't know a lot about dogs, but there were three identical dogs, and we were filming in Pasadena, and it was very, very hot, and uh, these dogs had the, the longest trailer in the world. I mean, a gorgeous <laughs> trailer. We had a honey air wagon. Conditioned it was and hot. Beautiful. They had air conditioning. So I was making jokes about the dog, and people knew I, didn't I wasn't fond of the situation. There was one scene where I had to drive a VW, up to uh, the house. And I grew up in New York City all my life. I was lucky to have a driver's license, mm -hmm. but driving stick, that's, that's a skill that I was never going to have in my life. So th these guys and all these guys on the crew, I was exposed to them for the first time. They were all seven feet tall, tough looking guys, leather necks with stuntman belts on, wearing mm -hmm. boots up to here and tight jeans and this and that. And, you know, I was the kid from New York. So uh, they said, okay, drive the VW up to the house and, and park the car. I said, okay, I wasn't going to tell them I couldn't drive stick. I yeah. was feeling like, you know, small over. So I got into the car and I said, it's not that hard. My friend had an MG in college. You step yeah. on a clutch and then you yeah. do something with this and you drive up to the house. Well, I did that. It chugged. It went back and forth. It went like this. We were hopping around. I finally got in front of the thing and everybody was standing around horrified. I had run over Boomer. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but no, I, <laughs> here's Boomer. I, <laughs> I ran over Boomer. Was it Boomer number one, two, or three? Well, it clearly wasn't the smart dog or the fast one. <laughs> but it was schmuck dog. It was, right, it was right. schmuck dog. It, I, I felt I was hard, my heart was going like what this. What did they I was say? So I mean, scared. They were, first of all, they thought I did it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and I would never do that to a dog of course or, not. Or, or a human. Yeah. But it was just horrible. I was, gee, I still feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I remember that. I remember that, was, that show and all the other ones of that time at NBC. Well, I have that, the I have the tape of me doing the. You don't see the the, the dog hit, but you see it chug back and, and go like this and hop the the thing and then go off wherever it, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> So you're the one, huh? I'm the one. <laughs> it's it, not on the air anymore, you notice. Oh I, oh, I know that. That and everything that was on the air back then is, is long gone. I remember one time uh, Fred Silverman, I worked with Fred at NBC, he was so excited the show was coming on called Super Train. Remember? No. 
Oh, well, it, it, it was going to be huge, Fred said. And it came on, and it, after about six weeks, it, it was doing so poorly, they, they, they took it off because it was expensive. And I was talking to him one time, he says, well, why didn't that work? I said, well, Fred, you put it on the air as an atomic-powered train, but you heard, ch -ch 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 -ch. I said, you know, atomic-powered trains don't go, ch -ch 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 -ch. I said, every train van in the country, the minute they heard that, they shut it off. Is it true that you once tried to join the CIA or thought no. about working for the CIA? Yeah, well, that's true, yeah. Uh, when I was in college, they were recruiting a lot in those days, the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And I thought it would be kind of fun, adventurous, and yeah, make exactly. use of the skills I had, <laughs> which I don't remember what they were. But No, but uh, as I recall, you, you had a very serious major in college. Yeah, uh, Chinese and Spanish and politics and right. things like that, right. yeah. So uh, I thought it might be fun, give me an opportunity to travel. <laughs> See the world. Right. I should have flown for Lufthansa, who knew, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 was, it was kind of interesting. I, I actually used it in a way to, um, to kind of travel around and spend a couple of years after college. I had a stipend to travel and do graduate work. And it was also serving the purpose right then. I didn't, I didn't want to serve in the military mm -hmm. in Vietnam. But I felt very strongly about it. I know it's kind of strange and schizophrenic. I felt very strongly about national security. I was on the right side of the issue in terms of uh, international politics and this and that. I was not happy with what was going on in China or the Soviet Union at the time. Um, so I wanted to do something that I felt was kind of patriotic or do, do some sort of service. Mm -hmm. I just didn't like the, our Vietnam involvement, not only me, many, uh, people, many did people, people did not. But I was, I was curious about what was going on, so I wound up spending time in Cambodia and Laos in 69. Oh, really? And Vietnam, I, I went for a few days uh, to Saigon. Uh, had some adventures there and traveled extensively then, to Japan and the Soviet Union and uh, this and that. And when I got back, I decided I, I didn't want to pursue that field anymore, so I naturally became an didn't actor. Didn't you wind up in jail in, the, in what was the Soviet Union? Yeah. One time? And, Let and me ask you about that, but I got a break waiting. We're chatting sure. here with Ron Silver from Veronica's Closet on NBC. We'll be right back after this short timeout. Uh, with Ron Silver, and you, what was the trouble you got into in the Soviet Union? You wound up there, I guess, when you weren't supposed to be there. Uh, yeah, it yeah, was, that would be a uh, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> when I was flying from a I'm, so, I'm so yeah. happy I'm here tonight, I can't tell you. <laughs> no, I hope you was, are happy. No, I am, I'm very oh. happy. It was 1969, and uh, the, uh, the Russians and the Chinese were having a border war at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, come back from Taiwan, and I had a lot of um, Chinese materials with me, and I was traveling in uh, Siberia, from in Khabarovsk on the Trans-Siberian Railroad into uh, Moscow and Leningrad. When I got to Leningrad, they found a lot of these materials on me, and I had uh, contacted a, a, a military person who ha had been in Czechoslovakia the previous August. And he gave me some material and he gave me his uniform. And I gave him some Banlon shirts, carton of uh, cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I forgot what else I had with me, that, uh, like a Playboy or something. Yeah, like or that. chocolates or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he gave me. And in the exchange of materials, they um, detained me and took me down to a local police station in Leningrad, kept me there for about 30. They didn't actually, the, the way they did it was pretty terrible because they came to my hotel room and uh, there were people in my hotel room that had seen me mm -hmm. uh, taken from my hotel room. Uh, and then I had, was gone for 36 hours. These are people I had traveled with in the Soviet Union and they left and left the country. Do you get nervous I, when I, something like that happens? I wasn't nervous at first, but... Uh, oh, because I the American was, consul's was, probably there in 30 minutes. I was too stupid to be nervous. They were not there. They didn't come. Oh. No, no. I, I contacted them. Nobody showed up. Mr. Silver, we're busy right now. <laughs> but, uh, no, they released me 36 hours later. I, I went to Kiev and uh, I left through Odessa. So it was okay? It was okay. Yeah, it was an interesting summer to uh, be in jail in Leningrad because that was the summer of Chappaquiddick and walking on the moon and the people were very awed by Americans. Not this one particular right. American <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. they threw in jail, <laughs> but basically it was yeah. Aside from you, there was that. great respect for the other 235 yeah, million or whatever of, the number yeah. was. You mentioned that your son is in college, and I, I read this afternoon that he's also adopted the sport of boxing. And he yeah, goes, he, he works I'm out. I'm very thrilled about that. <laughs> Actually, he's a, he's a very interesting uh, young man, and 
he, uh, he, he was never much for team sports. He doesn't like the discipline, uh, discipline of team sports. Uh, but he's very interested in writing and literature, and he's, he's very good and has a wonderful imagination, as does my daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, she's four years younger. Uh, but the only thing that he's really become entranced with is, is fighting, is really? boxing. And I asked him why, and he felt that he spent so much time, in, I guess, in his own head and with music and right. all these pursuits. He wanted to do something physical, and it, it's a way of testing himself and this and that. He speaks about it far more eloquently than I do. Uh, and uh, Does he go to the gym and have sparring parts? Yeah, he goes down to uh, Yonkers, and he gets in, and he does three, four, five rounds with, uh -huh. with people who would like to make it their life's work. So I'm, he, I'm very impressed that he does it, actually. Right, I'm and I'm, I'm sure he will learn the art of self-defense, uh, even though he may get clocked once in a while. Yeah, you know? he does get clocked once in a while. Well, yeah. these things happen in the it's ring. Also, yeah. it's amazing. You know, you, you, you spend three more minutes going one more round, and where you're doing pretty well, you, you have trouble lifting your arms. People don't realize how hard it is to keep those arms up and to keep fighting and moving. That's right, that's right. Um, Good luck to your son. Thanks a lot. And good luck to you. It's nice to see you again. And congratulations on your success. I almost said in, in Veronica's secret, but that's not what it is. It's I've Veronica's been successful secret. there as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy on this show. Ron Silver, one of the stars of Veronica's Closet, which appears on NBC. You'll check the listings for the exact time in your town. Next, the story of Debbie Morris is told by herself after these messages from our sponsors.